architecture that's actually being made and how does it affect society and work. And uh, today's presentation is going to be dealing with that. I'm going to first have a conversation about diversity, uh, more specifically cognitive diversity. I need to underline that part of cognitive diversity. And then how is the, why is cognitive diversity something so important? And what role is it playing today in the way that work and society is actually evolving because of all these technological changes? So uh, I have a bunch of different hats. I run a research department in a tech startup, which is called Uchange, which is based in Paris. Uh, at the same time, I give a few lectures. I'm a visiting lecturer and now a senior fellow at this school. Uh, I'm not really sure what that entitles me to do, but I'm going to figure that out pretty soon. Um, I've worked with Mark and Terence a couple of times. The last project that we did together was in circular economics uh, for the European Defense Agency. Um, and I've written a book on the blockchain, uh, the blockchain alternative rethinking macroeconomic policy and economic theory. So it comes back to that point that I just made about the implications, right? We're making all this new technology with blockchain, but what is it going to help us do? And is that going to help us change the way that the current existing system works? Because there's a number of flaws with it. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much uh, who I am and what I'm doing right now. So I wear a bunch of different hats. One of the hats that I like to wear sometimes is that of an economic historian. Uh, mostly I work with the hat of an economic sociologist. Uh, I'm not a social economist, there's, there's a big difference in if you mix those two words up together. But the role that I think I'm best at, and which I'm very proud of, is, is that I'm a good bullshit filter. Okay, I'm, I'm very proud of that, because I, I'm, I'm a bit of a skeptic. I'm a contrarian by nature, and when I see something the first time, I'm like, hold on, what's going on? And the reason that I mention this bullshit filter is because diversity is one of those subjects today. Diversity has been so misconstrued in a lot of ways because of political correctness. I, I like to call diversity the whipping boy of political correctness. Okay, and to test this, what I said was, I said, okay, fine, what do we actually understand by diversity? And I went and looked at all the CAC 40 companies. I actually read their sustainable development or their CSR or their annual reports. Okay, well, yeah, it was a very, very boring two weeks. Uh, and found out where are they actually talking about diversity and what are they actually recording, what are they measuring, what are they reporting? Some interesting results. Four of the CAC accounts don't actually do any reporting on diversity. Yeah, they have something on their website that says we are committed to it, blah, blah, blah. But you don't really get anything. When you say, like, okay, what are you doing? Uh, you look at any of the reports, you don't find something. Uh, almost everyone else who does talk about diversity and reports about it, they always talk about it in gender. There's a huge focus in gender. Now, gender is important. There is a difference in the way that men and women think, and I'll get to that in the next slide. But that's not really what diversity is. That gender for me is just one factor in diversity. We have to be able to open the space up a bit more to get a more scientific understanding of it. Sometimes they talk about age and disability. So that's not always uh, true uh, or not always reported. Only two have actually got, I would say, proper commitments towards LGBT. Uh, and one, which was coincidentally the first company that I started working when I came to France, talks about cultural mix. Okay, in which they actually promote people not just based on their competencies, but also whether they're a good fit in the country in which they're working. So that, that was a pretty interesting uh, factor that I found out. And the reason why I say that gender is only one factor in diversity is because there's a host of other ones, and I'm going to get to that in a sec second. Nevertheless, gender does play a role. Okay? And the reason that it plays a role is, guess what? Men and women are wired differently. So in 2013, I don't know if you can see the source over there, Sex Differences in the Structural Connections of the Human Brain. This was an article that was published in 2013 in which they actually did brain scans that said that, okay, fine, what's the wiring that's happening within the brain? Is it different for men? Is it different for women? And it turns out there is a difference. The reason for this difference is because throughout evolution, and I'm not just talking about humans, I'm talking about everything from cuttlefish to birds, the male species is normally the scavenger. It's the one that's trying to get somewhere to find more food, to find more mates, uh, in order to conquer territory, etc., etc. As a result of it, the male brain has been able to develop spatial cognition a lot better. When I say spatial cognition, it means that you're in a space and you get up and you look around and kind of find your bearings where you are and find a direction which you want to go to. As a result of this evolutionary uh, dissonance, you could say to a certain extent, male brains are generally better at perception, coordinating, and pathfinding, and the female brains are more intuitive, logical thinking, and better memory. Better memory is also because of emotions. Emotions are uh, recorders of, of, of instances. Like you're walking down the street, a snake jumps out in front of you. Guess what happens? It scares you. 
The next time you walk, you know, the same street, you get to the same point, there's no snake, but you're still going to hesitate. Because fear includes uh, memory. It's also the reason why if you have a fight with your wife or your girlfriend, you're going to forget about it in two weeks. She's not going to forget about it for the next two years. <laughs> and one way this, this cognition, this, this spatial cognition is actually manifested, is when you take an object and rot rotate it in, in, three, uh, in 3D. Okay? So it turns out that men are generally better at it because they, they have a brain to do that in a certain way. But guess what? The brain is also extremely plastic. So if you have a brain <clears throat> and you start training it with new kinds of and repetitive models and everything else, over a certain period of time, it will learn a new skill. So that whole conversation of, well, men are better at this and women are better at that, that just falls on its face because with enough training, guess what? A woman can do the same thing as well, right? The brain, brain is really, really plastic. And if you can say that it's neuroplasticity that's actually trumping cognitive learning processes, you realize that the culture actually trumps the way that the brain actually learns. Now this is the important point because it really brings us into the subject of cognitive differences or cognitive diversity. The place in which you live, the way in which you learn, all affects the way that you actually perceive information. So I wanted to give this excellent example of that headhunter right there. That's an actual headhunter from Borneo. And he's obviously got his very macabre collection along with him. And if you were a headhunter, let's say a child headhunter, five-year-old, ten-year-old, and you say to him, listen, your dad's got, you know, dead, uh, ten uh, cut heads in, in, his, in his house, what do you think of that? The child might give a response, well, I think he needs to up his game up because my uncle's about 15. In his culture, this is a very normal thing. For us, it's something that's un an inconceivable. We can't even believe that when we hear something like that. But the reason that he's able to perceive this, this, this information, it's the same information, a severed head, in a different kind of a way, is because he has evolved in a different culture. In evolutionary psychology, this is something which is called the lexiographic rule. And what the lexiographic rule essentially says is that you, when you are presented with any information, you will order that information in a certain kind of hierarchy based on what is important to you. Okay? And as a result of it, your perception of something is varied from culture to culture. So culture has a very, very important role in all of it. This is why when we are presented with the same kind of information, we interpret it in different ways because we have different perceptions of it. We come up with rules and decisions based on different kinds of heuristics. And finally, we make predictions based on it. The brain is a predicting machine because of the fact that it evolved, not in some institution like this, but in the jungles of the savanna. And it was constantly trying to protect itself, it was constantly trying to, to survive. And for that, it had to do some kind of linear prediction. Okay. Everyone with me till here? Yeah. Make sense to you? All right, great, let's carry on then. And I want to move on with this prediction because this is where the, the, the importance of, of cognitive diversity really gets underlined. <clears throat> so a few years back, this uh, professor by the name of Scott Page wrote this amazing book. I mean, he's written a bunch of them, but this one is something which I really like. It's called The Difference, in which he said, okay, fine. This ability to interpret information in a different kind of a way is it really something that can be used in order to come up with better decision making? Okay? Is it the wisdom of the crowd or the tyranny of the herd? Where are we in this? And what he did was he, he ran a bunch of experiments and you know, collected a lot of information. And what he realized is when you're trying to do any kind of predictive task, something in which you're trying to figure out what is going to happen in the future, it turns out that you need people who are extremely capable, definitely. But the quality of the prediction that's actually going to happen also depends on diversity. Matter of fact, the, the balance between ability and diversity is almost 50-50. So if you get a bunch of people who are very, very capable, but they all kind of think in the same way, you could say, same school, same kind of culture, et cetera, et cetera, you're going to have a predictive model which is going to have some kind of error. But if you were to give the same problem to equally qualified people, but from very diverse ways of thinking, they can be from completely different uh, areas of work, for example, the error is going to get reduced. Okay, and this very scary formula over there, that's essentially what it shows. Now, this isn't one of those you know, formulas in which like motivation equals inspiration plus hard work. This is one of those E is equal to MC squared kind of formulas. It just works. They tested it again and again and again, a lot of empirical evidence. And it shows that the way in which you think, if you have a group of people who think in different kinds of ways, they're going to be able to make a much more predictive model. Application of this, you see it in mutual funds. 30, 40 years ago, mutual funds used to be handled by a single person. All right? Mutual funds are always trying to predict. 
whatever your portfolio of stocks and equities and, and debentures are, you're trying to always predict what's going to happen, how is it going to move, are you going to beat the, the market, what's the alpha, et cetera, et cetera. It, it turns out that when you start having more and more teams with more diverse ways of thinking, then the ability of you to be able to make the prediction is a lot better. And that's the reason why today, 75% of mutual funds are run by teams and not as it was done before, in which 75% of mutual funds are run by one person. This slide is interesting because of this right there. You got two, you got three, and then you got four. Why is four less than three? It's too much labor. No, because two of the people think the same way. Adding number does not actually increase the diversity. See how this works? Right? And this, this report, I think it's just been published. I'm not sure about it. So you can check this up. I think there's a lot of stuff which, in, with regards to uh, mutual funds over here, and I think there's also some insurance stuff inside over here. So if anyone's working in those sectors, this is something that you can have a look at. All right. The second thing which Scott was able to find out is in complex problem solving. So we've spoken about the role of cognitive diversity in terms of uh, 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 prediction. Second problem is problem solving. So take a second and just look at this and think of what, what the number is between 5 and 13. Yeah, but that's our program director, by the way, who just gave the wrong answer. So we are in good hands. Thank you, someone. <laughs> All right. How many of you came up to eight using this way of thinking? Yeah, this is Fibonacci. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How many of you came up to this to the same number by thinking this way? <laughs> no, the, the answer is eight. It's just that the way that you calculate it depends on whether you're looking at it from left to right or right to left. All right? I see some people are still suffering from the hangover of last night, <laughs> present company included. So yeah. <laughs> so this problem solving thing is really interesting because it shows a really interesting example of how people think differently and how you can use it to solve really, really hard problems. Case in point is Netflix. So back in the, uh, a few years back, Netflix used to have this rating thing, OK? Essentially, if you go on Netflix and you start seeing some movie or whatever, they would measure the way that you actually appreciated certain kinds of movies, and they had six attributes for each and every movie. Romance, drama, this, that, all those different things. And they, based on that, they were able to predict that, okay, fine, if you are saying five stars to this kind of a movie, there's a pretty high chance you're going to like this next movie as well. Because all of these platform-based models are based on time on site. Okay, that's how Google, YouTube, all these things, they, they, the way that they measure is how much time you're spending on site. So being able to... Uh, give you a suggestion of what's the next movie you're going to be watching means that you're going to stay more time on that site. So it's really important for them. But they wanted to say if, if they could you know, improve that possibility of suggesting the right movie to you. So they put a challenge up online, kind of like a Kaggle challenge. Okay, this was, I think, before Kaggle was there. And they said if anyone can improve the prediction possibility of this, this, this very complex problem, by 10%, we'll give them a million dollars. Guess what happens? Belcor, which is part of AT&T, they say that, okay, fine, what we're going to do is we're going to look at all the different attributes, and they figured out that they can go from 6 to 50. Okay, so that's, I, don't, I don't even know how you classify a movie into 50 attributes. And based on that, they made some good models and everything else. In the end, they were able to do some of their best models were making uh, better predictions uh, by 6.8%. And in the end, they had 107 models, which when you aggregated the, the output of all of them, were able to come up to 8.4. Okay, still no 10%. Still no one million. So they said, okay, fine, we need to get some more different ways of thinking about this. So they went to this company called Big Chaos. And Big Chaos is like a pure math kind of a company. And what do they do over there? They're really good at putting the weights in these models. A lot of these models have got certain kinds of weights in which you say that this factor has got this amount of weight, this one's got less. And based on the way that they took these 107 models and weighed them in different kinds of ways, they were able to increase the accuracy from um, 8.4 to 9. Still no 10%. So they said, OK, let's get some more diversity. And Belco is a very rich company. That's at and They've got the resources or something like this. So they go to this other company called Pragmatic Theory, and they're behavioral scientists. Okay, Nothing to do with math. And what they said was, why are you guys limiting yourself to 50? We can find 800. And they came up with 800 attributes. And you put all of those things together, along with these 107 models. You synthesize all of it with the right weighting, and et cetera, et cetera. You come down to 17 models which gives you 10.06%. Technically, they won. But they're not the only guys who want to get the 1 million. 
when Belcor, because they're a large company, was able to get these other, you know, very specialized kind of companies to work with them, the people who, are, who also wanted, you could say, the, the smaller uh, players in this game, they said, you know what, we're going to beat them at their own game. They came together and they created this very dramatic title called the Ensemble. And essentially, there's 23 teams from 30 countries, so you can already start thinking about the diversity that's happening over there. They came up with 48 models together and they had the same result. What's interesting about this is because you see diversity in two different ways. One set, what was done by Belcor, you had the diversity in terms of having a large number of models and a large number of attributes, okay? But a small group of players. On the other side, you have diversity in which they didn't have a lot of models or attributes, but they had different ways of thinking because they had different kinds of teams coming together. Irrespective, what it actually shows you is if you have diversity in differences in the way that you interpret information, then you're going to be able to solve a very complex problem a lot better. And this is normally the case for prediction and problem solving. It doesn't work all the time. It has to be context relevant. If you're working in a, in a factory, you don't need a lot of diversity in order to take one piece of metal over here and put it over there, right? It has to be context relevant. And what he found, and you can find this in his book, uh, The Difference, is really that it, it depends where you're working on it. And why does it work this way? Because of the fact that we interpret information in different ways. Okay? So I'm coming towards the end of my, my little talk on, on diversity before I get into the implications of this in a, a tech society, you could say. And today we have a lot of focus on social categorizations of diversity. We look at race, we look at ethnicity, gender, et cetera, et cetera. No one's saying that it's not important, but it's not the be all and the end all. If you have 10 people who come from different countries or they have different ethnicities, right, but they've all gone to the same kind of school, on a political correctness level, you are diverse because you've got someone whose origin is from Morocco, someone from India, someone who's Chinese, put some women in there so that you're even more politically correct. And in the end of the day, you say, well, we're a diverse team. But is that actually helping you gain a profit? Because if you're not following the science behind it, no amount of political correctness is actually going to be useful for you. And that's what we need to start thinking. We need a whole new measuring system in terms of how to do it, something that I'm personally working on today. Because I, I'm, I get pissed off really fast when I see stuff like this. Like I said, I'm, that's why I'm the bullshit meter. And I think that we need to have a much more mature conversation because if we are going to create a new kind of workforce, under what guiding principles are we doing it? Political correctness, for me, is not a guiding principle. It's actually the, the, the opposite of that. <laughs> So now we get to the second part of the talk, which is, uh, what is this role? Why is it important for us to pay so much attention to all of these things uh, in what kind of a context? And I like to talk about technology because technology has got this really, really weird effect. Um, throughout history, you find that societies reach a certain kind of a breaking point based on the architecture, okay? I'm using an engineering term, but based on the architecture. And at some point of time, it becomes too structured, it doesn't really work, it becomes too saturated. And lo and behold, a new technology comes inside which breaks up the existing system. And a new system is created from that. It takes hundreds of years for this to happen. One of the first examples, or one of the most uh, interesting examples, is what happened in the 15th century. In the 15th century, the church was essentially the uniting factor. You had a lot of, before that, in the Middle Ages, you had a lot of you know, serfdoms and people fighting between themselves in small kinds of groups. In Western civilization, the church said, we're going to come here and bring order. They united these serfdoms, started pol passing political policies, and, and effectively controlled these new states that were made. And over a period of time, they got much more bigger, much more sophisticated, much more complicated. Towards the end of the 15th century, they had reached that point, and rather than actually solving problems, they were actually creating more political animosities. And we, all of a sudden, the introduction of gunpowder comes into Western civilization. Okay? Gunpowder was invented a lot before that, but it comes into Western civilization. Gunpowder is really interesting as a technological revolution because it allows you to kill more effectively. You can now scale your, your combat with whoever you're doing it, right? Before you had to use like spheres and God knows what not. Now you can blow them to smithereens. Problem is, gunpowder is expensive. So what happens? the kings start giving more and more power to traders and merchants. Over a period of time, these traders and merchants start moving up in society because of the fact that they are the ones who are actually getting the revenue so that you can buy this gunpowder. Over a course of 300 years, their 
economic issues now become political issues. And power starts to fragment. Society starts to fragment. It's no longer the church and kings and the subjects. It's now church, kings, traders, and citizens. Big difference between subjects and citizens, right? The second one, the, the, the second technological uh, revolution which helped it was the invention of the printing press because that helped an intellectual revolution and it spread faster. As a result of these changes, we started seeing new kinds of ways of work. The Industrial Revolution, which started in the 1770s, is just one part of that. But what it shows us is before you had 90% of the population that worked in agriculture, or maybe even 99%. As society started to fragment and you know, merchants started trading and new technologies were built up steadily on top of it, rather than having nation states, you started having these hierarchies in, in terms of uh, how factories were actually made. So once again, you find this fracturation kind of thing that happens. Industrial revolution leads to the age of the steam and the railway, leads to you know, the, uh, the heavy industries that we have today, and leads to something very interesting, the organizational man. The organizational man is not someone who believes in rugged individualism, as they used to have back in the, the Wild West. He is someone who believes in the collectivistic ethic of the corporation. He's a manager, he's over there, and what's he actually doing? He's not really doing a lot, he's a manager. Because these, these companies are structured in such a way in which they have a large number of people doing something very small, something very menial, which doesn't need, need a lot of education, uh, there's a lot of complexity that's happening around over there. And the manager, the organizational man, is essentially trying to manage a lot of this. He doesn't take decisions, but he processes information from the bottom to the top. So information goes from bottom to up, and decision making comes in the opposite direction. This is essentially how it happened for the past three to 400 years until this happened. 1970s, the internet is pretty much you know, thrown out into the world. I mean, it's been being built up before that, but it starts getting used by a larger and larger number of people, and this creates a problem. All of a sudden, the amount of information that's being created is exceeding the decision-making capa uh, capacity. It's no longer people who are actually just you know, doing a very simplistic job. They're creating information at the same time as well. And as you create more and more information, the balance between decision making and information starts to get out of kilter. There's a very popular Bitcoin guy by the name of Andreas Antonopoulos, and I love this, he has a phrase for it. He says the, the throughput of decision making, the number of decisions that can be made per minute, you can't scale it anymore because now there's too much information that's actually happening, right? And th what this shows is when you have any kind of centralized architecture, because right now we're still talking about mechanistic hierarchies, very pyramidal kinds of shapes of society. At one point of time, because there's too much information that's actually going through it, you can't make the, the right amount of efficient decisions. As a result of the internet, so there's already this, this, this information deluge that's actually cramping up the, the existing system. But the problem with technology is actually feeds of other technologies, and it leads to the creation of much more interesting revolutions. Thanks to the internet, we led to robotics, very cheap robotics as well. This is the, uh, the Baxter robot. I think it costs like $10,000 or something like that. And it can, you can work with humans along with it. 3D printing, 3D bioprinting, CRISPR, biosynthesis, one of your hockey stick graphs right there. And of course, you know, today we're talking about drones and doing this and that. So essentially because of the fact that there's more information that's being spread around in the society, it gets used by different people. The way in which they use that information is extremely diverse and it leads to the creation of new kinds of technologies, okay? So the way you interpret information, if it's different, you're going to use it differently, and that's why you have multiple technologies building off each other. That's what Mark was saying today morning, that it's not just one technology that's working individually. It's because of the fact that they converge together and they move in rapid bounces rather than just linear ways that these changes happen. So apart from changing the, the, or highlighting the inefficiencies with an existing architecture, what it also is doing is reshaping the way that we uh, trade with each other. 1970s and right up to the early 2000s, the economy which was set in place and the system that we worked in was really able to leverage globalization to a large extent. But now that you've got these technologies, it doesn't really make sense to open up a manufacturing plant in China because you can do the same thing over here with less capital. Most capital costs are based on hiring humans. If you can get a 3D printer along with a robot, well, guess what? You can do it right there. You don't need a huge manufacturing plant in order to do it. BCG did some research on this and figured out that 
most of the US companies are actually doing reshoring today. This is from 2016, the number's probably gone up. And it's leading to something which is very weird. It's leading to reverse globalization. How many people have heard of that term before? <laughs> of, of course, Mark. There you go. So this is something which more and more people are getting attuned to today, in which you realize that the very architecture of not just work, not just institutions, but society in general is getting more and more fragmented. Okay? These are just some, um, I have to add a little bit of economics inside to show actually the, the, the way that this is actually happening and the, the pace at which it's happening. This is some research which came out from uh, the Institute for National Strategic Studies. And you can see the, the, the trades are actually going down because of the fact that they no longer need to uh, have offshore. At the same time, labor, sh uh, the labor share in, in manufacturing is going down. Productivity in manufacturing is actually on the up. It's just that you don't require a lot of people to do it. Okay? And this is not just in manufacturing, it's pretty much for any sector. Any sector that you look at, you find the same tendency again and again, except, of course, finance. But we know that why that is, right? There was a report that came out yesterday, I, I can't remember if it was The Guardian or somewhere, in which they, they found that, no, sorry, it was the Financial Times, it was written by Gillian Tett, in which they found out that um, equity trades today, only 10% of equity trades have human involvement. 90% of equity trades are done by algorithms, and no one even knows how the hell these damn things work. But productivity is good, good profits. And the reason I'm, I'm giving you all of these different kinds of examples is because this fragmentation is leading to an effect in what we think in terms of work. It's affecting the way that we think in terms of jobs. David Arter, a very renowned uh, MIT economist, came up with this uh, report in 2013 in which he said that what's ex essentially happening today is that the only places in which we find growth are jobs or tasks which involve uh, non-repetitive cognitive tasks in which you need to use your brain and non-repetitive physical tasks, manual tasks. Okay? Uh, the reason for that is anything that can be repeatable or which can be codified, you can automate it. If you're doing the same kind of action again and again and again, it's going to be automated. And look at that slide, it's really interesting. When does this take off? In the 1970s. What happened in the 1970s? Internet was unleashed onto the world in full scale. So we're seeing a gradual change, and now the change is getting more and more divergent, in which the only places in which you can actually have uh, job security, you could say to a certain extent, is in non-cognitive, uh, non-routine cognitive jobs. And non-routine cognitive jobs is something like what I do. Every day that I go to work, I never do the same thing again. I do research, I have to publish something, I've got to work on this, I've got to work on that. A neurosurgeon, anyone who works in a job in which every day is a bit different compared to the last, that's a non-repetitive job. It can be a manual one as well. Celebrity dog walker, nurse, those kind of jobs as well are manual, but they're non-repetitive. And what a surprise. If you want to do problem solving a prediction, which is what most of these cognitive non-repetitive jobs do, it well, turns out it works better if you have diversity. You can't separate these two together. I actually made each presentation individually, and in the course of making these two, I kind of said to myself, oh my God, they're, they're interlinked. So in order for us to think about work for the next century at least, or at least for the next 20 or 30 years, we've got to understand this concept of diversity, because <laughs> guess where all the jobs are going to be created? Guess where, where people are actually going to execute what they're learning in institutions, in non-routine cognitive jobs? And it turns out that problem solving and prediction are normally what they do in these kinds of jobs. And for that, you need to have diversity. So I'm coming towards the end of my presentation. Everything clear till here? Is this making sense to you guys? All right. So I'm going to put it a bit in context, because I need to be able to show you, OK, what do I interpret this? This is my own opinion. OK, this is my own opinion based on my own readings. A lot of this is work in progress, so take it with a pinch of salt. And if you disagree, that's great. I'm more than happy to have a debate. Um, I kind of live for those kind of things. I'm a simple man. What you find is we, we're going through a certain kind of a pattern that gets repeated again and again. An existing architecture starts becoming inefficient. It leads to increasing frustration because of bad decision making. All of a sudden, you have this technological change that happens. It's not all of a sudden. They normally build up, but it happens. It gets injected into society. Either the costs go down or it becomes efficient enough to be used at scale. A new information and decision-making architecture is created. 
which leads to a new kind of a work, and a system gets fragmented and hierarchies start to dissolve. Hierarchies which existed in the 70s don't exist today, and what we have is more flatter and flatter structures. It affects the way that we work. 70s and 60s, the boss came inside the office, everyone stood up and said, good morning, sir. Today my boss gets inside, like hell, I'm gonna stand up. I'll probably give him a high five if he's nice to me. Culture can't be separated from the, way, the architecture in which you work, okay? And the reason for that is because technology kind of evolves in a certain kind of a way. It goes from specialization to diversity, from diversity to ubiquity. It then becomes extremely social, and then it becomes extremely complex. Every technology follows this trend. This is Kevin Kelly, by the way, the guy who created Wired magazine, and probably uh, one of the true polymaths that actually exist. Every technological thing <coughs> kind of goes this way. And in the process of doing so, it fragments the structure, uh, working structure, creating new kinds of employment, creating a new way of thinking in the process. The problem with the, the technological change that's happening today is that the pace is getting smaller. Before, this used to happen on long cycles, 300 years, 200 years. Today, 10 years. So your ability to understand history is very, very important if you want to be able to find some kind of a guideline to the future and a healthy appreciation of the present, which is the response that I gave to this gentleman a little before. If you don't take my word for it, listen to people who are much brighter than me. Otto Kozler wrote about it in The Act of Creation. Thomas Kuhn wrote about it in uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. E.O. Wilson, the Nobel Prize winner, I mentioned this book before, wrote it in Consilience. And most recently, Stephen Wolfram, who invented uh, Wolfram Alpha, uh, did that. He, he, he tracked all his mentors, you could say, and found that they all exhibit the same kind of tendency in how technology evolves and what it does to society in the process. So what is this leading to? 10 years back, something really interesting got created as a job. It used to be called, it still is called the same thing, it's called the, the freelance front end. Front end people who are really re important when you're trying to make a website or do any, anything else. Uh, they were so much in demand because you know there's, the, there's so many people who want to get into the internet game, you could say, that they didn't need to work for anyone. They could use their own house and have used platforms and come up with small groups and work for anyone that they wanted. So they became freelancers. Today, because you have all these different kinds of technologies, an individual person can become a solo entrepreneur. I can go and use platforms and use service, you know, software as a service kind of products and essentially make myself a complete freelancer. Okay? Great example of this is this guy, I just found him on, uh, on LinkedIn. He used to be a marketing director, so very you know, classical kind of a job. Then he became a professional Instagrammer. Don't laugh at this because th th these guys, they have some amazing stories to tell and they, have, they make a lot of money out of it. And now he's created a, his own little group. Okay, it's called the Mobile Media Lab. Guess what he does as director of client relations? He helps YouTubers and Instagrammers to make business models around them. That's his job. It's his company. And what I talk about is something like this. Does anyone know this guy? I don't follow him on Instagram. I don't have Instagram, but I just like this guy. He's called the, the Swim Reaper. And he goes around dressed in a black dashiki, taking these ridiculous pictures. They're amazingly funny. You know, they're very innocent, they're very funny. When I looked at it, it's like, haha, this is cool. Then I found out that he's making between 70 and 100 grand. I'm like, why am I studying? <laughs> like, why? Why am I doing this? Right? But okay, this is obviously not something that he's going to be able to do for the next five years. But what it shows you is anyone today can use these kind of platforms and services to figure out a way that he wants to work, to figure out how he wants to generate a revenue. A much more uh, interesting uh, example is this guy. So I found him recently on YouTube when I was watching Mother, Mother Base, which is uh, Motherboard, sorry, which is one of the things which is done by Vice News. This guy is an electrical engineer. He bought a Tesla, decided to tinker around with it, broke it open, took out the battery, said, oh, how does this stuff work? Then found that the cost of solar panels is actually going down, so installed a few in his house, then bought a power wall, which is also made by the same uh, company, and said that, okay, fine, I can actually use the same tech that's over here, but make do-it-yourself do kits. And he started making these, this YouTube channel in which he said, like, guys, this is how you can make a power wall, but using like regular batteries like this. Do-it-yourself kits, which cost a fraction of the price. Then he said, why can't I use it in order to power my car? So he got rid of the internal combustion engine, 
retrofitted his car to be able to charge it as an electrical vehicle and started doing this for himself. Pretty soon other people got hold of him and then they started using their old car. So you remember that car, right? That's like a 1980s car. It was a big thing back in the day. They're now retrofitting all of these cars this way. More importantly, he's generating so much energy that he doesn't know what to do with it. So what does he do? He uses his car as a, as a charger. He then uses the excess energy and shares it with his neighbor. He's created an ecosystem where he works. I think this is in Los Angeles, or I'm not sure where it is. It's in the US. But you're seeing the same thing in Utrecht, in the Netherlands, in which you're creating individual economies, one person coming up with an idea, using different kinds of platforms in order to put that stuff out over there, creating a community, and completely dissecting themselves from the energy infrastructure, something that we think we're all connected to all the time. Separate grids are being made. Of course, the scale is small, but you see how this works? This fragmentation is not actually happening just in terms of how a company is organized. It's changing the way that people actually conceive about work. Jehu Garcia is no longer doing an electrical engineering job. He is now a full-time YouTube personality, developing this community around him. And guess what? Helping the, the, the ecology at the same time. I'm not as heroic as that, but I said, let me see if this applies to me as well. And I did a, a very simple analysis. I went on my Excel spreadsheet and I said, how much time do I spend and how many jobs do I do? Technically, I'm just supposed to be head of research at a tech startup in Paris. But I do a little bit of teaching on the side. It takes a little bit of my time. I give speeches here and there. That takes a bit of my time. And I found out that I actually do five jobs. My main job is the big orange ball that you have over there as head of research. That's 55% of my time. Okay. Job number two, four is the teaching, and um, mostly in macroeconomics and tech application and blockchain as well to a certain extent. That's another 15% of my time. Speaking events, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The small red dot, that's really interesting. It's the only job that I do, and I call it a job because I actually make time in my timetable to do it. It's the only one I don't get paid for, but it's the most important one. It's reading. Reading and then thinking about stuff and writing about it. I don't get paid for it, or not as much as I should. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Yeah. <laughs> but the, that affects all my other jobs. And the reason it works is because of the simple fact that what I read and what I talk about can be recorded, put on a YouTube, and I am essentially creating my own solo entrepreneurship company around me, even though I have an existing job, a full-time job. I just put this slide in because I thought it was interesting. The uh, Brookings Institute estimates that by 2025, the sharing economy is going to get to 335 billion. It's at 14 billion today. It shows how the sharing economy and all this fragmentation is actually uh, going to impact the way that we do. But coming back to what I was just saying a little bit before, this fragmentation of my identity, because today I'm no longer just the guy who does head of research. I'm the speaker, I'm the TEDx guy, I'm the blockchain guy, I'm all these different identities is now creating a way in which I can use these platforms for different identities. I am no longer a single individual. The fragmentation is not just to the societal level, it's actually at the individual level, right? And guess what happens when you're fragmenting your own individuality to a certain case? To execute certain kind of tasks, you need to work with other people. No man is an island. And what do you need in order to be able to work with different kinds of people? You need diversity. You see how this all wraps up? You can't separate any one of these, okay? And like I said, this is still a work in progress. So some of my thoughts might be a bit um, un inart inarticulate to a certain extent. But I just want to give you that vibe because I think it's a really important thing to have a conversation on in the future. Today we're using it to give you an idea of how these different identities are working together in different kinds of diversities. Thank you very much, Saman. This is a company that I personally enjoy. It's a, it's, a, it's a platform, it's called Colony. And essentially what you do is you get down over there, you work on a certain kind of a task, you can create a community with which you can work with other people. Based on your contribution, you get voted upon and you get a remuneration based on it and it all happens on the blockchain. They're using this technology to actually leverage the fragmentation of work and the individual's capabilities. Whether you're an Instagrammer or a guy who can write code in blockchain. What's happening is the function of money is something that we need to rethink. The three functions of money is unit of account, means of exchange, and store of value. Today what is happening is unit of account is essentially your identity. The means of exchange is the task that you perform based on the community in which you're involved in. And the store of reputation is your, repu uh, sorry, the store of value is your reputation. Reputation is going to be something that can be monetized in the future. It already is today, right? 
Always was, exactly. And what it's doing is it's allowing more and more people to create companies a lot, and lot, a lot faster. I wanted to check if what I'm thinking about is true. Is this fragmentation actually having that kind of an impact? I looked at the healthcare center, and I love CB Insights. They just make these really cool uh, um, in, in infographics. And just by looking at the health sector, I went to AI, I went to cancer therapy, and I went to synthetic biology. Normally, companies which were very, very well funded are the only ones who used to participate in these areas before. Look at the number of startups that are actually popping inside over there. This fragmentation is leading to greater diversity as well. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the last slide just shows you the number of companies that are now being valued at one billion, the unicorn club, you could say. Okay. I don't want to spend too much time on this because I don't have uh, enough time left. I've been warned already. Uh, but Doug Engelbart, the guy who actually created the mouse back in the 50s, started thinking about this when they first started having the information revolution in those days. And what he found is that there is two different kinds of ways in which, we need, in which humans work. We have tools and capabilities that we create, but at the same time, there are also human-centric contributions. And it's only by unifying the two that you can be able to be a productive member of a society and have an actual kind of way of job. The problem is that is moving too damn fast. And because we are still stuck by thinking about th things in terms of hierarchical st mechanistic structures, we're not able to adapt quicker over here. And a lot of the stuff which is over here, the way that organizational structures, the procedures which they follow, <coughs> right? The customs and the language. Language is really important in that way. That's why you can't separate it either. <laughs> Depends on the skills and knowledge and training that you have. And the skills and knowledge and training that you have needs to be related to this. This is the reason why we have this, these kind of conversations today. Because of the simple fact that we have not been able to adapt ourselves, or at least appreciate the rate at which this is going on. I mean, he wrote about media, portrayal, and stuff, but you have the new vocabulary that's related to it on, on the right-hand side. Right? And what I'm trying to provide you with is, is, is a picture of how this is actually changing us. How is work being changed? How is all of these different things? Who are the people who are leveraging, and what is the new kind of work that you're going to be creating based on it? It's no longer going to be large companies that are going to be there. You're going to have more and more people who are solo entrepreneurs or working together in small groups, and you're going to essentially have governance systems which are completely distributed. You need to have distributed governance systems. Changes like this happen once every hundred year, uh, couple of hundred years in human civilization. We're very fortunate because we need to be careful of what we're doing with it, obviously, but it also gives us a front seat to this kind of a change and a role to play in it. So to finish up, what's essentially happening for me is if the 19th century was the industrial age and the 20th century was the information age, the 21st century is the age of the cooperative. Okay? And I love this quote by Herbert Spencer because he wrote this back in, the, in 1857. From the earliest traceable cosmical changes down to the latest results of civilization, we shall find that the transformation of the homogenous into the heterogeneous is that in which, you, in which progress consists. Fragmentation is essentially a good thing because more and more heterogeneity, more and more diversity in the way that we think about this is exactly what we need to leverage if we are to adapt to this new era. That's good, right?